I call the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, verses 19 through 26. Listen for the word of God. The thought of my affliction and my homelessness is wormwood and gall. My soul continually thinks and is bowed down within me, but I call this to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is, the, it is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, we come once again to have you speak to our hearts. So may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It's a strange book that we're preaching on this morning. We don't often preach on the words of the Latin, Book of Lamentations. I have to admit, when I was a, when I was a kid, I thought it was a laminated work. And I thought, what are we doing laminating things? But Lamentations, well, it's kind of gloomy, the laments of the Bible. Kind of like my buddy Eeyore here. Always gloomy. Nothing ever seems to go right. A lament, as a verb, means to express sorrow, mourning, or regret for often demonstrating things. And it's often very demonstrative. You lament, you raise your hand, you've heard of the wailing that comes out of some people when they're lamenting. As a noun, a lament is a cry out in grief. Biblically, the laments are crying out to God in our pain and our despair, asking God for relief. Many of the psalms are psalms of lament. They're wonderful to read through when you're feeling down, when you're feeling like nobody cares, when you're feeling kind of like you are. You read the books of the psalms of lament. And of course, the book of Lamentations is a whole book of laments. It was probably written during the, ex the Babylonian exile in the 6th century before Christ. The word that's used for the title of Lamentation means how. It's, just, it's as if the writer of the Lamentations was saying, How, Lord? How could you have let this happen? How long will this last? Well, I talked to the kids about ghost towns. And Jerusalem is a ghost town in this story. It is absolutely relying on ruins. It is an awful, awful scene. One eyewitness to the scenes out of the book of Psalms wrote, says that the temple was desecrated and the, the, the invaders who left Jerusalem not much more than a pile of stones. He wrote, they left the bodies of your people for the vultures, the bodies of your servant for wild animals to eat. They shed your people's blood like water blood flowed all throughout Jerusalem and no one was left even to bury the dead. The surrounding nations insult us. They laugh at us and they mock us. And now, the marauders and the armies have left, and the brighter lamentations begin to dirge. How deserted the city that was once so full of people. Did these people blame God for what had happened to their city? Well, there was no question of them abandoning their belief in God. They held tightly onto that. No question at all that they would continue to believe in God. But the temptation when things like this happen, when, when terrible things happen in our lives, is to slide into some morose atheism. And not, it wasn't even the slightest possibility for these folks, though. They were firm believers in God. They were God's people. And they knew that God had his reason for what happened. And so in some respects, they blamed God. But it really wasn't blame. Their complaint was not that God was punishing them. The, the punishment was too severe a discipline from which they might not recover. They were stupefied in the destruction and the loss of life. It was incomprehensible that temple worship was no longer an option. They'd been so faithful in the past. Now they couldn't do it again. They said all of this was too severe with no foreseeable endpoint. What is going to happen? 
So they cried out to God. And later on they shook their fists at God saying, why did this happen? <coughs> but like all biblical laments, they then turned back to God, acknowledging that God is merciful and forgiving. That's why we read the first part in chapter 1, telling what had happened. And in chapter 3 is the song of hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. We sing the song, don't we? His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. They're saying, and they lament, in their song of hope, that they need to wait patiently. God is good. God is merciful. These bad things will pass. There is hope. Our souls can be ghost towns. Our souls can be in, feel empty and lifeless. I hear, I see the tumbleweeds blowing through some of our souls. And I hear that song. <coughs> quietness of our souls. When bad things happen in our lives, whether it's our lives or in our <coughs> world, are we quick to blame God? To blame God for all that has happened to us? Well, there are evangel and evangelical preachers who claim that bad things are God's punishment. 9-11, you heard, if you remember, you heard people say, well, that's God's punishment for our bad, for the course our nation has taken. Hurricanes, why those, of course, are God's punishment. Earthquakes, those are God's punishment. Really? We're much like, more likely, though, to be introspective and wonder why these things happen and how they might be prevented. Generally, we're hopeful that someday, perhaps not in our lifetime, we'll find a way to keep children safe in our schools and, and keep domestic terrorists from blowing up our buildings and poisoning our water supplies. It's grim stuff. <coughs> it is unfortunately the world we live in. But friends, we can't blame God. We don't blame God. Well, we could. My former colleague in New Jersey wrote, but before we went down that road, and not wanting to hear the heavens peeling with laughter, we have to exonerate or exalt ourselves of any responsibility. He says, this means we have to have the chutzpah to say to God, hey, we haven't done anything. So why are you doing this, this to us? Why do you let these things happen? And after God calms down and re regains his divine composure, hey, Michael Gabriel, they're blaming me for the mess they're in. Yeah, I'm not making this stuff up, seriously. God says to us, you're right. You haven't done anything. Next question. <coughs> Dan Dick, the United Methodist Church, one that he was in the season of the Bishop wrote, These scriptures speak across the centuries to entire cultures where taking responsibility becomes anathema, where whatever happens is always someone else's fault or failing. He says, We are living in such times. Persons in politics and government constantly play a blame game, accusing opposing parties and individuals of malicious intent, corruption, and conspiracy. Our courts are filled with nuisance claims that assign guilt while advocating responsibility. A student punished by his parent for not doing his homework who sues them for emotional trauma. Don't try this, guys. And wins. A young woman gives a sermon on responsibility to the poor and marginalized that she claims made, herself, made her so uncomfortable that she had to leave that church. A professor is fired for using terminology that a student finds objectionable. The wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, judgments come forth perverted. He says, we live in a time of fake news and alternative facts, and many people are deeply offended when they are asked to be accountable for their words and their actions. The writers of the prophetic scriptures clearly proclaim that such actions have consequences. And until we are ready to accept responsibility, things cannot change for the better. When our souls are dry, dusty ghost towns, <laughs> It's easy to wallow in self-pity, to blame everyone and everything else for our problems. But when we are filled with the Spirit, we can say with the writer of Lamentations, 
even in the midst of despair. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Hope is in the Lord. Don't blame the Lord. But take hope in the Lord that we can turn things around. It is this hope which Thomas Chisholm refers to in the chorus of his great hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. He writes, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is Thy Faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. So we need to take responsibility. We need to take responsibility for our actions. But even in our darkest, driest places, the hope of the Lord can bring light. Even when we are in despair, the hope of the Lord will be there. The Lord's love and faith is always faithful. So hope in the Lord. He will come through these dark, dry places. Life will fill your soul again. And know that God is always, always with you. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, we thank you for filling our souls. In our despair, help us know that you are there. Fill us with your spirit so that we will be good and kind and faithful. That we will serve others that our souls may be alive and not dry, dusty ghost towns. We ask that you fill us with your spirit so much that we will never know, we will never experience your love, your loss again, that we will always know that you know us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.